Right. So without any further ado, I think we'll go to John Reddish. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've uh, got the task of doing this overview. Um, for some people, this will be really very basic, but for others, it might be completely mysterious. I, I just simply don't know. But the important thing is that a croquet club should be structured in a way that best suits its needs, uh, both now and in the future. Um, because a structure can have financial implications. It has an impact on members' liability for the debts of the organization. It can influence how the club is viewed by other people, particularly banks, funding providers, and potential donors. And there are different rules and regulations covering each of the potential uh, structures. Now, a club can be either uh, unincorporated or incorporated. Um, I suspect that those of you who haven't really considered this or are in the process of considering will be in your club's un unincorporated associations. Um, there are a few uh, other types, but I think that's the majority. Anybody want to put their hand up if they're now a member of a croquet club, which is an unincorporated association? Quite a few, yeah, I suspect so. Well, what is an incorporated, unincorporated association? Well, it's um, a, uh, a, a an undefined, that is undefined by statute, but it is defined by common law and there are cases on it and I can give people notes of that if they want to look at them, but there basically has to be a group of people gathered for a common purpose, not for profit, and intending to create a legally binding relationship between themselves. The, if, the important thing is you don't have to register an unincorporated association with anybody and it doesn't cost you anything to set it up. So if you are thinking of setting up a croquet club from scratch, then an unincorporated association is probably the first point. The, an unincorporated association uh, has certain difficulties which arise from the fact that it isn't actually a legal personality. It's merely a gathering of people. So if you want to enter into a contract and you might, you, for example, a lease or a contract for a lease, um, then you've got to act by trustees. That's common enough, it's usually with the chairman and the treasurer or something like that. They have to be registered now with HMRC, which has caused a bit of a problem. I can't use mine for Zoom. Sorry, Sorry I didn't. Yes, I just muted. Uh... Yeah, um, so the that's a requirement which has been recently introduced for the purposes of uh, preventing money laundering, but don't worry too much about it. That's a separate question. Um, the other thing is if somebody wants to give something to the unincorporated association, uh, they, they can't. The unincorporated association isn't capable of holding property, uh, but the answer of course is that it will be the the gift of would be to a person or persons uh, to hold it on behalf of the association the common legal solution if this isn't done explicitly is that the gift is treated as being to all the existing members subject to the association's constitution so there's no general problem in sticking with an unincorporated association in the model in the modern world it's uh, usually uh, no problem because the liabilities question is usually covered by insurance, but I'm told, and I'm sure that it's true, that there are particularly uninsurable liabilities that might arise, and that makes incorporation pretty much essential. A warning, though, if you are a member of an unincorporated association which has valuable assets, for example, some land, uh, because it was given to the club many years ago, and there's no constitutional provision against distribution of the assets to the members, definitely stick with your unincorporated association because it could make you very rich. The uh, problem, though, is that it also means that you almost certainly will be involved in litigation as to who is entitled to part of the 12 million pounds that you sell the cricket club for or whatever. So we move on to corporate bodies. There are several different corporate bodies. The first one, the most obvious one, is a private limited company which has shares. That's commonly encountered, but I don't think there are many croquet clubs that are in which people have shares. If they do, then that's fine. Uh, 
Unfortunately, the Companies Act, which applies, has 1,300 sections and 16 schedules. So where are we going to start? Well, the answer is we're not. We'll move on because we move then to the most obvious uh, company structure, which is a company limited by guarantee. Uh, that's got no sh shareholders. It's typically used by non-profit making organizations, charities, and of course, by sports clubs. The uh, company is controlled by the guarantors. They're the members. They guarantee a nominal sum of money to the company in the event of it becoming uh, insolvent. And that is uh, the limit. And that limit is something like one pound or two pounds or whatever it is chosen. Um, the main reason why a, a charity or a sports club uh, would incorporate is to ensure the protection of the people who are running the show, uh, particularly, of course, the volunteers from any personal liability for the company's debt. Uh, the insurance position is fairly clear. It, the CA provides public liability insurance and employers liability insurance, professional indemnity and directors and officers cover for all member clubs. Uh, if you want to find out whether that covers you, you need to look at the website and there is a page there which sets it all out. I've, I've got the reference if you need it, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's fairly comprehensive. It's pretty sim simple to set up a company limited by guarantee, but it, there are some legal requirements and you might need some professional assistance to do it. Um, there are leaflets on the company's house website and they are available to assist. Um, all companies limited by a guarantee must be registered with companies house and they have to, you have to report annually. Basically, you have to send them the accounts. A company limited by a guarantee must have one director and at least one guarantor. And the information about the directors will be available on public documents. Um, you have to adopt articles of association. They outline the rules and the regulations which the company has to follow. Uh, these are effectively the same as any constitution which you have uh, for an unincorporated association. The next and probably now the most uh, important one is the charitable incorporated organization. Now that I'll come to again, because first of all, we ought to consider charitable status and cask status. They're quite different because uh, a, a club can have uh, a charitable status whatever its uh, status in terms of its legal structure. So what, what are we talking about here? Well, charitable status you can get either by applying for it or by applying to become a community amateur sports club. Now that doesn't actually give you traffic char charitable status, but it gives you almost all of the benefits of being a charity without having to do the things that charities have to do. And um, the, uh, the, the advantages are not inconsiderable. Uh, the quotation is that there are considerable advantages in the tax treatment they receive. Uh, charities are generally uh, prohibited from trading um, unless it's an incidental part of their main function. And if they are going to do trading, of course, they have to set up a separate company. So it all gets a bit complicated. This will be a subsidiary company and it's owned and controlled by the charity with the aim of generating income uh, for the parent charity. This is allowed uh, and has provided that there is priority given to the charity and that all of the profits of the subsidiary company or companies go to the charity. Well, now, selling sports equipment to members for use in the sport would not require a subsidiary company. But I've always thought, and I think I stand to be corrected, but if you were running a bar or a cafe, which is open to the public, then it seems to me that that might well require a subsidiary company. If you're a cask, you don't have that problem because a cask is controlled uh, as to its trading activities by special rules which apply and the uh, limits that are uh, imposed have to be followed. Um, so what's um, what's the, the good points about it? Well, donations to a cask and to a charity from UK taxpayers uh, are included or can be in the gift aid system. 
uh, membership subscriptions, payments for services, which I hold uh, incorporates tournament, tournament entry fees, they can't be included in the gift aid system. Um, if a club has charitable or, or cash status, more donations may reasonably be expected from other sources. At least it is from higher rate taxpayers because higher rate taxpayers uh, have the ability to deduct, at least in part, their donations to castes and charities. Uh, so if a person who is a member or is a potential donor is liable to pay tax at a higher rate, the reduction is 20% if you're liable to pay at 40% and 25% if you're liable to pay at 45%. So when a donation is, a donation is made by a will, uh, and this seems to me to be rather significant, the donation is taken off the estate before inheritance tax is calculated in the unlikely event that the donation is large enough, and it has to be at least 10% of the net estate, uh, the rate at which inheritance tax is levied on the remainder of the estate is reduced by 4%, from 40% to 36% at the current rates. Another important consideration is that companies making donations to a charity or to a cask usually able to set those off against their profits. Companies do support croquet clubs and sometimes fairly generously and more may be encouraged to do that if there is tax relief involved. Um, potential donors such as community action funds, we've come across quite a, lo a lot of those recently, and they are now more commonplace. It's, this is uh, hush money paid by people who don't want you to complain about what they're doing. This is a foundation, for example, that uh, has the rights and the money to make donations to amenity projects, for example, within 10 miles of a landfill or within a certain distance of a solar farm. They're usually able to give money to casks, but not to clubs that are not registered as casks. That varies from depending on the powers that they have. So there are some fairly clear benefits to being a charity, uh, but there are certain rules and regulations and obligations which apply to them. So far as a cask is concerned, the particular ones, there is a, a paper on the website. I think it's very good, but that's because I wrote it. And um, there, there is a clue in the title, um, Community Amateur Sports Club. You have to be a community club. That means you can't discriminate in favor of or against anybody. That doesn't only include people who are covered by the Equality Act. It also applies to people who haven't got any sporting talent whatsoever. You can't have entry trials and you can't um, have tests of their competence before they can enter. It's not possible to have a system for a proposer and a seconder because that means that they, there's a limit. And of course, you can't have black balls for those who are not um, acceptable to the existing members. So amateur, well, amateur means what it says, but actually you can pay people to play for the sport if anybody is doing that, well, fine, because the maximum amount to be paid in any one year is uh, 10,000 pounds as a, to everybody who's paid to play. Um, that, of course, with rugby clubs and football clubs and so on is quite important. Uh, the members who are paid to do work at the club, um, as behind the bar or coaching or mowing the lawns or whatever it may be, as long as that's at arm's length and they're not paid additionally or higher rates than ordinary people, so to speak, then that's not included. Uh, the main purpose of the club has to be for sport. Now, sport means a sport that is accepted. Croquet is a sport. Uh, this is accepted by the authorities. But bridge is not a, uh, a sport, and you have to be careful about that because the final uh, provision is that there must be at least 50% of the members uh, participating in the sport. Now, this was introduced in 2015 to stop student drinking clubs being described as casks um, and just pretending that they were playing sports. Uh, one comes across those from time to time, and obviously the HMRC didn't like it very much. Um, so it means that you have to play uh, once a month, 12 times a year, provided that the club is open for 12, for 12 months and proportionately for whatever period of time in a year the club is open. 
Furthermore, the club must be non-profit making. That means that the, any surpluses must be used to in the uh, for the benefit of the club and reinvested in it. The other requirement is that the managers, who are usually the committee, uh, must be fit and proper persons. That's a quite a complicated uh, definition. It's in the Finance Act 2010, if you happen to be interested. Lots of people are excluded. Um, but if the committee members aren't fraudsters, promoters of tax avoidance schemes, or similarly tainted individuals, all should be well. The other requirements are the membership fees. Most of these wouldn't apply to any cricket club that I've encountered, with the possible exception of Hurlingham. They, they mustn't exceed £1,612 per annum. Uh, if the, an, the annual fee is more than £520, special arrangements have to be made for members of modest means to pay £520 or less. The club's trading and rental income must not exceed £100,000. Members um, are not entitled, have to be disentitled from receiving any benefit from the club, either by way of dividend or other payment or, or uh, a share in the assets if the club is dissolved. Um, that's something which might require attention for an existing croquet club because you may not have the, the appropriate provision in the constitution. The um, provision has been slightly amended because um, the uh, provision that has to be made now is um, th th that the assets after payment of all the debts have to go either to another cask or to the governing body, to the CA, or possibly also it would work for the Federation, but on the basis that they will use it for, for purposes which are uh, the uh, promotion of the sport. Um, you can't be a, a charity and a cask. Clubs are able to register as charities, but the attendant requirements sometimes are thought uh, to be uh, too burdensome to make it worthwhile, and I'll come to those in a moment. But if a, a, a cask wants to become a charity, you can't. You've got to set up a new charity and transfer all the activities to that uh, new body. What are the burdens? Well, the burdens of a cask are a modest amount of extra work for the treasurer or an assistant treasurer, if that's appropriate, because proper records of donations have to be kept, gift aid declarations have to be gathered in, and gift aid claims made each year, or more regularly, if that's appropriate, uh, either online or by post. There are no requirements for annual reports and no penalties for failure to provide them. The um, if the club has any aspirations to becoming professional, and I don't know of any croquet club that in this country at any rate that does, uh, you shouldn't register as a cask. The particular benefits are exemption from corporation tax. Well, that's obviously applicable if you're a corporation. Um, and uh, there is uh, a limit on the trading turnover, 50,000 and the property income of less than 30,000. So these may well not be very relevant to the average croquet club. Um, all interest received and chargeable capital gains are free of corporation tax for a cask. There's a mandatory 80% relief from business rates. That's the thing that a lot of people are benefit benefiting from. And then there's gift aid on qualifying donations. That's 25p in the pound for every pound do uh, donated. Now, obviously, donations have to be donations, not fiddling arrangements. But there are a number of ways which have been tried and tested and which HMRC accepts of gathering in uh, from the normal activities of a croquet club. I'm not going to set them all out now. I don't have the time, but they are in the paper that I wrote and they're tried and tested. And uh, I have a look at those if you're not already doing it. It is a fact, as far as I'm told, that very few clubs actually use the gift aid system. Um, it's it's the bore if you're only claiming a few pounds, uh, but uh, as, when times are hard, a few pounds might be very helpful to the club. Um, any donations must be, as it were, genuine. Uh, they can't be made uh, payments for goods and services, and no benefit can accrue to the donor. The, the donation mustn't be in any way required, and a donation mustn't be repayable because then it's not a donation, it's a loan. 
Um, you can make reference, if you're interested, uh, to Chapter 9 and of Part 13 of the Corporation Tax Act of 2010. That is the pleasure of reading that is, I have to tell you, somewhat limited. And so is the pleasure to be derived from reading the uh, Community Amateur Sports Clubs Regulations 2015. Um, however, the detailed guidance notes are probably essential reading if you're thinking of becoming a CASC. Uh, and they're on a government website with the usual lengthy uh, uh, way of getting to it. There is also a website which is called caskinfo.co.uk and that's well worth a look. Um, about 25% of croquet clubs, I haven't actually counted, but that's a figure that was quoted to me, are already casks and um, about uh, less than 10% of the government subsidy which that involves is actually given to uh, clubs in that way. As I say, usually it's in the form of the rate relief. Charitable Incorporated Association, that's been of great interest to the Croquet Association, as you will know, because we have, after a great deal of consideration, uh, applied to the Charity Commission for such a registration. When an application is made to HMRC for a CAS status, they usually answer very quickly. Indeed, when I did it many years ago, I was able to phone up in a place in Edinburgh and there seemed to be a lot of people sitting around waiting for a phone call and um, they were very keen to be of assistance. Um, I'm told that clubs, and there are a few, and we're going to perhaps hear from one or two, who applied for us CIO status, I've had it done very quickly in a matter of days. The CA applied a long time ago, and we answered the questions which were posed on, I think, the 9th of November, and we haven't had anything from them since. So there is, I fear, a long delay. I don't know quite why that is, but I suspect it's the senior people uh, at the Charities Commission who are working from home or, or, or perhaps not working at all. Um, the biggest benefit of being a charity, it is said, and I suspect that it's right, is that capital funding may be available from other charities. And that's, of course, uh, a very considerable benefit. Um, the numbers of croquet clubs who've already done this, I think, on my count, we're up to three. Um, and uh, there may be others in the pipeline and others about which I haven't been told. The application to the Charity Commission nobody seems to be able to tell you how long it will be least of all the charity commission and uh, we've been as I, as i've said waiting for months what you have to provide is a constitution in draft there is a model constitution that's got to be followed the gaps have to be completed appropriately and it's then submitted to the um, commission with an application form the main constitutional features are, of course, charitable purposes. This isn't a problem because the Charities Act 2006 made uh, the promotion of amateur sport a charitable object. And um, the standard form for this has, I think, now been uh, fixed by the Charity Commission. I say that because I've had a sight of all the croquet clubs who've got a, a, a charitable uh, incorporation and they're they're all the same and that's because the charity commission wrote to them and said you've got to change this and what it says is the object of the cao is the promotion of community participation in healthy recreation in the name of the club and the surrounding area by providing facilities to participate in the sport of amateur croquet at all levels. Facilities means land buildings, equipment and organizing sporting activities. So that's all in a model form, which I've now placed onto the website. I wrote it some time ago, but I didn't put it up because I thought probably more sensible to wait until the CA had got charitable status and become a CAO. Um, but because of this evening, it's now there. You've got to do some fairly careful drafting, but that's not difficult if you've got a model for it. And as I say, it'll be it's on the website. I can give you the uh, link if you need it. Um, the downside is that you've got to produce annual reports for the Charity Commission, and those include the accounts. There is a time limit on that, and they these must be made and sent to the Charity Commission, though not to the company's house. So it seems reasonable to suggest that if you're thinking of incorporation, 
and you think that charitable status might be a good idea, you can, by this means, that is applying for a CIO, do it all at the same time. That's something which the charities, uh, bodies who support charities, have been asking for for some time, and it now exists. There are about 17,000 or so CIOs, I'm told, and I don't know how many of them are sports clubs. What I do know is that none of them is a governing body of a sports club, with the one very, very narrow exception, something to do with the power uh, wheelchair football club. Um, so the, um, the general regulations are in place, and they will govern the whole things. That's the general regulations for CIOs. Uh, and a trustee of a CIO can't take part in any decision from which he or she would be would directly or indirectly benefit personally. That seems to be a potential problem because it means that, well, it certainly means that the chairman can't uh, get the club to buy a mallet for him or her, but it does mean that there are some rather delicate situations, but there is a slight qualification. It's unless the, the uh, person couldn't reasonably be regarded as having a conflict of interest. So if the club decided to buy a lot of mallets for the use of youngsters or something like that, but at the risk that they might use them themselves seems to be ignored it, it's as a technicality. Um, charity law does require that the income and property of a CIO must be applied solely for the objects and not for the benefit of members of or the charity trustees, except as is permitted by the governing document. So it's um, it, it's a bit of a problem if you're thinking of being a trustee because there are responsibilities. Those responsibilities are not particularly onerous, but if you don't fulfill them, uh, failing to run a charity properly does have rather serious consequences. So uh, that's it. I hope I've, well, I haven't run over time, but uh, anybody, if anybody's got questions, I'll, I'll take them, but it may be that at the end, I don't know, up to you, Paul. Yeah, yeah thanks very much for that, John. You, you, the amount you got across in that time was uh, very, very impressive. And I think it's very useful that we've got the access to this later on as recording. But I think what we'll do, John, is we'll take, there is one question at the moment, we'll, we'll keep that till the end. Okay. Um, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the other presentations. Now, I know Lynn's worried uh, because we, you've covered a great deal of her area that she was gonna do. And I suspect Paul might be feeling the same. But what, what I thought is really important was to see this from a club's perspective yeah to uh to listen to them because um obviously they've got a different uh different experience of this so many thanks again john we'll, we will no doubt come back to you when we come to the q a so lynn over to you thank you paul good evening everyone as paul said most of my bits have been covered um but i will carry on with the um presentation that i've done it will repeat some of what uh, paul has said but if you're thinking about becoming a CASC, I think it will be useful. Uh, Bath has been registered as a community amateur sports club for approximately three years. Uh, we gave considerable thought into how we would take our club forward. And the crucial thing about making the choice was you decide what's best fit for you um, and your projected situation of the club. Um, doing nothing meant we were liable for tax on our savings that we had accumulated for the, for the provision of a clubhouse. Uh, ultimately, our landlord uh, provided us with a clubhouse, so we had quite a bit of money and we wanted to uh, make sure we used that wisely and didn't really want to give it back to the taxman. Our club is unincorporated. Um, as Paul said, the main disadvantage is that the club trustees have personal um, unlimited liability. However, our club's constitution indemnifies the trustees, the insurance cover we have in place and the limited contracts that we enter do not put our um, individuals at significant financial risk. Another reason why we chose to become a cast was that once registered, the ongoing paperwork could be dealt with quite comfortably by um, a competent and organized person. After all, we join our clubs to play croquet, don't we? Not to be sat completing complex tax forms. Uh, so I'm going to move across to the presentation. It's setting out um, key points 
which I know John has covered, but I think they're important and I've got some bits to say around them. So I'll just uh, share my screen and then we'll, we'll go from there. While Lynn's doing that, what we will make available um, later on is the link to the CA website for all the, um, the materials that John's produced. You are right there, Lynn? Yeah, I just, uh, it looks like it's coming up on a desktop, which uh, is not what I wanted it to come up as. <laughs> Right. What am I actually sharing? Not what I want to you share. Need to get, you need to get rid of the front screen. You had it behind it. You had um, a Zoom screen came up as well. So, Right, I'll put that first. That's it, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I'm there. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah. right. So becoming a cask. Um, the four things that um, I wanted to look at were the eligibility, the gift aid, tax implications and the business rates relief. So to register for a cask, um, you need to provide the facilities for an eligible sport, as we say. And 50% of the um, members need to be in attendance. Now we keep our attendance register with um, the lawn booking system that I think most of uh, croquet clubs use. It was provided kindly by Campbell Morrison. Uh, we can easily collect the data to demonstrate that 50% of our members have attended. And it's actually works out at seven or more times during April to October uh, inclusive. We usually reach that point by the end of June. So, um, but I must point out, as John did, that our bridge section, who are social members, but classed as members of the club, uh, their attendance cannot be included in our attendance figures. And we get the seven, by the way, because we only operate for seven months of the year. Uh, we set up um, the, a formal constitution known as a governing document, and you can Google for cast model constitutions to get a typical example. Um, prior to registration, we did make changes to our constitution in line with HMRC requirements. So during the application process, you do really need to leave, leave quite a bit of time for your members to agree those alterations. Uh, casks must be open to all ethnicities, nationalities, etc. And I'm sure our, most of our clubs are um, and do. Um, we have to be open to the whole community and have affordable membership fees, Mas maximum cost being £31 a week. But again, it's seasonally adjusted um, and our winter play doesn't get uh, governed by that because um, it's not within our season. Our winter play is open to the committee deciding whether the lawns are open or not. Um, you need to be organised on an amateur basis. So again, make no profit unless um, this is reinvested in the club and spent only on promoting participation and providing facilities for eligible sports. Not pay more than £10,000 in total to all players. Um, be nice if you know, we had any money to do that. Uh, provide only the benefits normally associated with an amateur sports club, such as use of equipment, coaching, post-match refreshments and only pay expenses for matches and tours where players take part and promote the club's sport. Uh, be set up and provide facilities in the UK, uh, Iceland, etc., and uh, to be managed by fit and proper persons. Now that fit and proper persons means that you have to complete documents that are provided by HMRC. Uh, we have two um, authorised officials they're the only persons that are authorised to submit repayment claims with HMRC. Uh, we also have two responsible persons and they are currently two of our trustees, but they could be committee members, chair, treasurer, secretary. 
uh, but uh, you do have to um, go through various paperwork um, for HMRC as to be registered. And looking at the gift aid, um, you can claim back 25p every time an individual donates a pound to your cask. Um, you can claim gift aid online and you should get your payment within five weeks of claiming. Usually it comes much more quickly than that. Um, you can claim gift aid on donations from individuals, but the donor must have paid the same amount or more in tax, um, income tax or capital gains tax in that tax year. And make a gift aid con a declaration that gives you permission to claim it. Now, as a club, we have a declaration on our membership forms that memberships can sign, uh, members can sign when joining to give permission. And uh, so that means we can actually claim it. And we also have a note on there about um, being a CA member. So it's a standard um, thing on our membership for, for the joining the club. If the donor has not made a, a declaration, you may still be able to claim on cash donations of £30 or less. Um, perhaps a collection tin or um, boxes out on a, um, an event you're taking. Um, and these are called um, gift aid small donations, or GADs. You can claim up to £2,000 in a tax year, but your GADs uh, claim cannot be more than 10 times your gift aid claim. Um, so you need to record the total cash donations collected, the date of collection, the date it was paid into the bank and any um, contactless card donations that you've taken, for example, receipts from your card machine. Uh, and we've been told that you actually have to keep a note of the domination of any bank notes. Um, but uh, that was by a phone call with HMRC. So there are special rules for many of the situations with the um, gift aid. And one thing I just mentioned to you is that if a volunteer says to you, oh, keep my expenses, that's all right. Um, you can't do that. It must be recorded as paid to the volunteer and then given back as a separate transaction to the cash task in order to uh, claim the gift aid. Uh, we've claimed back, back about £1,500 in the time we've been registered. Uh, but bear in mind, we were closed down for quite a bit of that because of um, COVID. So uh, we're expecting to get more than that um, in the coming uh, years. So the tax implications, um, you can claim tax relief um, on income gains and profits from some activities. Um, bank interest, gift aid donations, including donations made by a trading company that's owned by your cask. Um, capital gains, profit from selling or disposing of an asset, trading profits if your turnover is less than five, uh, 50,000 pounds a year, which um, ours is, but that may impact on larger clubs that have uh, bars and things. Where a club is registered with a cask for only part of the accounting period, as we are, um, there is a um, calculation made to show the uh, different amounts that the trading would cover. So we're open April to October um, officially um, with regard to our trading, although we are, our loans are um, open after that. Um, income up to 30,000 a year for renting out property, if you have that option. And if the money comes from members with full voting rights, you also won't pay um, income from membership fees and profits from selling food and drink relating to the club's sporting activities and members' bars. So we do pay tax, um, VAT, although you may be exempt for fundraising and sporting activities, tax on income of more than 30,000 a year from renting out your property, business rates, but you can apply for relief of up to 50%, tax on trading profits if the turnover is more than 50,000 a year, and you'll pay tax on the full amount after deducting any allowable expenses. And you can then reclaim your gift aid donations, your GADs or bank interests. And you've got to keep your records um, of all transactions you want to claim tax relief on for um, six years. Uh, it's relatively straightforward to claim the tax um, once you've got your gift aid government gateway code and you've set up your passwords, you're away.
uh, business rates relief. Uh, again, you, as I've said, you can claim 80% of that. And if you contact your local council to see if you're eligible, you may be able to um, claim up to 100% um, with discretionary relief. So that's something worth um, looking into. So finally, uh, to register as a community amateur sports uh, cask, you need to fill in the form A1. You need to bear in mind that you cannot withdraw your application once it's been made. Um, if you um, decide you want to further down the line um, change, then you have to actually um, close the club completely and start again. You cannot just deregister. So it's something to, to bear in mind. Um, as Paul said, the Community Amateur Sports Club's detailed guidance notes um, are very useful. Uh, and where there are many boxes on your application, um, forms are notoriously difficult to fill in. Um, we did actually put um, some supporting evidence. So for instance, we haven't got family memberships. So we just wrote an accompanying letter and that helped us to actually um, get ours through. Our application went in in May 2020 and it was backdated, as I say, to November 2019. Um, and as Paul said, there is a link on the CA website, starting a croquet club, which gives information about um, and it lead directly back to the cask. Fantastic. Thank you very so, much. Can I just say, Henriette, our, um, our treasurer, has said if anyone is interested in becoming a cask and wants a bit of um, support, she's more than happy to um, help them. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Anna. Sorry, that was a bit of a duplication. No, but, no, uh, no, no it's right. It was good. It was good to get that, you know, uh, across again, I think, and that you did bring out some extra points as well. So many, many thanks. Thanks. Okay. So uh, again, we'll wait for the Q and A's for you later on. Uh, and last but not least, Paul, you're muted at the moment. Right. Uh, good evening to you. My name is Paul. I'm from Northampton Croquet Club and we went the CIO route um, qualifying in September 2020. So this is going to be my presentation. It'll come as no surprise to the other presenters that um, I also will reiterate some of the material that they've done, but I'll try to fly through those elements um, and give you the sort of personal view of what our club actually did. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, the number in the bottom is our charity registration number. It's a very important number when you're making uh, claims or applying for grant aid. So what I'm gonna talk about, hang on a second, is what our particular drivers were, the process that we went through, again, apologies if it reiterates some other stuff, the reporting requirements, because as John mentioned, um, there are reporting requirements to the Charity Commission. Realising the benefits, so what benefit have we actually received from being a CIO? And then one or two things on final thoughts. Again, some of those will reiterate what previous speakers have said. So our drivers. So one of the points John made was about understanding the cu club's current legal status. You mentioned unincorporated associations. Um, and the most important aspect to that for us was who's financially liable. So very quickly, our history was um, just as COVID struck, uh, our then landlords of some 30 years decided they'd like to redevelop the space that we occupy. And so very politely showed us the door. Realizing that we'd have to start again, and that could involve quite a financial commitment, and that in order to attain grant aid, we would be looking for relatively long lease agreements. We, we wanted to understand what our financial liability was for us and our members. By us, I mean the committee and the members. And then, as John described, we hit into an incorporated association and what the impact would be if an individual signed a lease for 10 years, it, £6,000 a year. Um, so 
that was a big driver for us. So what were our options? All the things that John spoke about. Um, so we wanted to remove, uh, as best we could, personal financial liability for committee and members. That drives you to incorporation and the club being a legal entity in its own right. So the club can be sued, not the individuals. Uh, there's a proviso against that, and that is as long as you're not negligent. If you're proven to be negligent, you're just as liable as if you have no cover at all. Uh, we also looked at benefits of being a charity. Um, again, reiterating what others have said, the gift aid uh, that Lynn covered off in some detail also increased opportunities. Uh, John also mentioned there's a lot of funders out there who will only fund activities with other charities or charities in general. And uh, I'll come on to a personal experience. Charities tend to go up the pecking order when uh, many organisations have applied for grant aid. Um, so it's a way of sort of doing a bit of queue jumping. Um, the other thing is, what if we made a mistake? We wanted an option that we could potentially wind out of if we realised we'd uh, made a mistake. So all those things considered, we went through uh, the material that John's outlined and other bits and pieces, including talking to other sports clubs, not, not just croquet clubs, but other clubs. Um, yeah. So we studied all of those uh, and we came up with the relatively recently thing called a charitable incorporated organization was a viable route for us. And it seemed to address all of the issues and all of the points we wanted to cover. First of all, a health warning. I'm going to describe something that's going to sound incredibly bureaucratic. I'm not going to deny it. It can be bureaucratic, but at the end of the day, we felt it was worth it. And again, reiterating what other speakers have said, the fact that someone in the community has gone through this process means you've got a shoulder to cry on or raise a hand to ask a question. Uh, so like the other organisations, first of all, you need to get an account through the Charity Commission to register your interest. Uh, there's a link there. The, this process is free. Um, apart from obviously the hours that you may have to put in doing the bureaucracy. Other thing before I go into the process is nomenclature. One of the issues we have with our members was them understanding the difference between a trustee and a committee member, and they're quite different. So the analogy I use was uh, comparing it with a company. So shareholders appoint directors broadly, uh, in which case members will elect trustees. The trustees can choose managers to allocate them suitable responsibilities and authority. And that's generally the, the committee. So a committee member doesn't have to be a trustee. The important factor here, as I'm sure John would uh, reiterate, and has said in his piece, trustees are legally responsible collectively. And what that means, normally in a club, the treasurer does the accounts, um, might be checked by one other person on your committee or two, and the rest of the committee just nod sagely. Not acceptable for a charity trustee. Every single trustee bears responsibility. So if there's something wrong with something like the accounts, all of the trustees' heads are on the block. And that's a very important thing with a, a charity that you have to recognise. And the last point I made before, bear in mind you're not protected if you're negligent. So just like a CAS, the most important document is the governance document or constitution. So what we did is we set up a working party of three of us. We reviewed our current club constitution, which was loosely based on the model established by the Croquet Association. And obviously over time, things have been added to it. And then reviewed it against the template that's available from the Charity Commission. Now, the template on the, the, the Charity Commission presents you with has lots of options. Uh, so, for example, does your club have the um, office of honorary office of president? If it doesn't, it won't be in the Constitution. But there's a whole section in the Charity Commission 
that allows you to specify that you, yes, you want to have the honorary position of president, and this is how you're going to elect this person. Uh, this is what you want to do when they uh, resign or are replaced, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there's options about how long should a, a trustee serve? How many terms of that service should you allow a trustee? Many of those concepts are probably already in your constitution. Um, but again, it, the template is many pages and it just needs going through those things, ticking the boxes or the sections that are relevant and removing those that aren't. One example we found um, was a club that took their current constitute, this isn't a croquet club, by the way, took their current constitution and shoehorned it into the uh, Charity Commission template. Not only did that create immense confusion with their membership, there were conflicts in, in that constitution, and it took nine months for their process to, to go through the Charity Commission for acceptance. So the closer you can adhere to the model provided by the Charity Commission, the quicker the process is, notwithstanding what John said about the CA's process, and I believe it's unusual because the CA is a governing body. And the other thing you can do is add clauses. Um, so just because it's a template doesn't mean you can, can add stuff. You just need to be careful about what you add. So we added a clause. So we, at the time, were in a temporary home. And as part of the Constitution, you're obliged to specify your area of operation, your address of operation. Um, and we were at a temporary home. Now, when we moved to our permanent home, in theory, that would be a change to the constitution that would have to be ratified by our members and then by the charity commission. So we put a clause to say, the trustees can change the, um, and it's my words, and it might not be the exact words that are in the constitution, I can't remember offhand, but we could change our uh, location address. And the trustees could do that without reference to the members or the charity commission. And they accepted that. They thought that was brilliant. Yeah, you've, you've done it in the right way. It's in the right section, tick in the box. So you can add clauses. Uh, again, message from this part of the process is don't shoehorn in your current constitution. Read the Charity Commission if you're going this route. Template carefully, compare and contrast. You also need some policies. The most essential one for a charity is the safeguarding policy. And don't be afraid to uh, take advice and lift things. So we use the then uh, Croquet Association safeguarding policy and just recast it in terms of a club rather than a governing body. We also took the opportunity to look at our data protection because we keep records on computers, members' details on computers. We set up a financial and reserves policy because we knew we were going to be dealing with uh, relatively large sums of money for a croquet club. Health and safety. Again, we've got a health and safety risk register, and that enables compliance with the public liability offered by the Croquet Association. And we have a policy about how we set that thing up, how we run it, etc. Uh, we also reviewed disciplinary policy, and we took that from the uh, Croquet Association and obviously an equality policy uh, to demonstrate these things. All these things we offered uh, in our paperwork to the Charity Commission, they didn't query any of them. So whether they were just looking for compliance and that we had these policies rather than looking at the detail, that's my suspicion, um, but they're there. And again, if anyone wants to pull on those, I recommend looking at the CA policies and I'd recommend looking at other local clubs policies or look at ours. Uh, we've obviously got a club handbook. I'm sure most, if not all of you have got those with more croquet specific uh, information. And we started a, an asset register. Why? Well, because we incorporated and if, if we fail to meet our obligations in terms of financially, um, 
why, where is the money in the club invested? Now, we've chosen to register all non-consumable items over £100. So the, the hoops, the balls, the shed. Uh, we've got a shipping container that we use for secure storage, our mower, et cetera, et cetera. This was an interesting one for us. The only thing that, that wasn't in our submission that the Charity Commission asked us for was a risk register. And this is more of a business risk register. And again, they've got a, a very rich template. I would estimate that 50, 60, 70% of it is irrelevant to us. But we chose to keep it and fill it in. We sent it back to them and they just ticked a box. They didn't ask us any questions about why is that particular item in your eyes low risk? Why is that one um, medium risk? Why is that one high risk? And again, all of these things I can share with people if, if they want that level of detail. So the only thing they asked us for was our risk register so that they can understand what risks, sorry, that we understood what risks we were taking on. Then like the Croquet Association, we did a presentation to our members at a general meeting and made sure we included that the, there were uh, the relevant controls to transfer assets to the new organization. All those documents then went off to the Charity Commission. And then for us, it took just over two weeks for them to come back um, with our charity certificate then. And then we had to do another submission to HMRC to qualify for gift aid. And that submission had that certificate that you can see on your screen, plus a statement of accounts, plus our constitution. You'd have thought they'd have trusted each other, but they don't. They want to see the same, uh, broadly the same amount of information. And that came through in a couple of weeks as well. Um, this is the thing that um, people alluded to in terms of the reporting requirement. And sometimes it can read and sound like it's onerous. So each year uh, we're required to submit a trustee's annual report called a TAR, trustee's annual report, T-A-R, and our accounts. Uh, when you go over 25K income, your accounts have to be examined. That doesn't mean audit um, for the financial people out there. An account examination isn't the same as an account audit. An examination says, you say you've spent £10, £100 uh, on this item, and there's a receipt that shows that that to be true. You've received this money in and you've banked it, and there's a bank statement that proves that is the case. It doesn't say that you spend the money wisely does it, or anything like that. As you get into that concept, you're talking about audit, and then you need hundreds of K to need an audit. Um, because of our crowdfunder campaign, we breached the 25k income barrier, so we had our accounts examined. That wasn't a problem because we have them examined every year as a confidence boost for our members. And we write that in the trustees annual report as well, because it's confidence to anyone who might be considering funding us or contributing to us. So yes, so there's a template as well for um, the uh, payments and receipts. We chose to do that as well on the basis that people who go to the Charity Commission website to look up charities and see if they're a worthy cause they want to support um, because they're familiar with that format. So we changed our format very modestly uh, to conform to that template because it's more readily accessible to those that might want to look at it. So how onerous is this thing called a trustee's annual report? Um, depends on what you're going for. If you're just satisfying the reporting requirement, it can be as little as a few pages. Your receipt and payment accounts on a single sheet of A4 from most clubs, and something that's equivalent to what a chairman might say or a chairperson might say at the AGM. What's the club been up to this year? Where has it been successful? What's its intention for the next year? So it can be as little as a couple of pages. Uh, ours is nine or 10 pages. 
why have we put so much in into it? Because we're still trying to apply for grants and impress the hell out of everyone. So um, there is a degree of boilerplate stuff you have to say, uh, like uh, the trustees don't receive any money from the club, etc. Some of the things John alluded to. Um, but the important thing is these documents are a matter of public record. So if you went to the Charity Commission website and you looked up charity 1191519, you'll come across Northampton Croquet Club and you'll see all these documents that I've been talking about. And if you were interested in uh, sponsoring us or donating to us, you'd be able to see if it was money well spent. What, what exactly is the club up to? What's its aims? Uh, all those kind of things. How well does it work towards its aims? Um, and that's why we fill out our trustees annual report. Realizing the benefits. Um, we don't know, we haven't had any cause to know, uh, we've got no financial liability issues that we needed protection from. There was one funny thing though, when the club became a legal entity in its own right, we saved some, we received something from the TV licensing people saying, did we need a TV license? It's like, nope, because there's no power where we are. And we certainly haven't got any TV aerials. Um, one of the things uh, John alluded to was um, grant requests and more serious consideration. Yeah, we've got evidence of that. Um, we applied to our, one of the places we applied for a local grant for was the local parish council. And uh, the Bowls Club, who's uh, cited very close to us, told us you won't stand a cat in hell's chance of getting anything out of them. They don't support sport. I went to the um, parish council meeting and presented to them. As soon as they saw that we were a charity, they bumped us straight up and we got our thousand pounds. So uh, maybe small fry, but certainly that carried more weight than the Bowls Club, who out of interest, um, in addressing their public liability, uh, sorry, uh, their financial liability issues became a limited company uh, that John described. Uh, gift aid claims, again, like Lynn said from Bath, uh, we've um, raised something like 1.6K. Most of that came from our crowdfunder campaign, and we've got another claim in for a similar amount this year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite lucrative. Um, and again, building on that in terms of final thoughts, being smart with gift aid, um, with a byline of monetizing the generosity of members. So we've got uh, a couple of ground crews who go out and look after the ground for us. Um, so the club said, we will pay um, mileage, petrol money on a mileage rate that's... Um, 46p a mile, standard rate, recognised by HMRC is a kind of a typical rate. So we pay that, and as Lynn said, in reflecting that cost, uh, those members are paid that money for their travel, working on behalf of uh, giving up their, their time as well as their travel for the club, valid expense, and they will donate it back again. So the club has uh, net zero cost from that, However, it's a donation now because they've given the, the money the club and therefore we get 25% if they're a taxpayer from HMRC. Um, so there's all sorts of ways um, that you can be smart about uh, monetizing the generosity of members. Uh, if you want to contact me or have any follow-up questions, you can contact me at that address or look me up on the um, CA members area. I'm Paul Char, and I'm from Northampton. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Paul. As ever, always very, very good. And thanks to all three of our presenters this evening. Uh, I thought it was very uh, comprehensive. And now it's an opportunity to you, for you to ask questions. I will go to the chat ones first of all. So uh, the first one was from Angarad. How do you manage unacceptable behaviour in a cask if you can't deny membership applications? 
Who would like to answer that one? Uh, John, are you happy to do that? You muted it. I'll answer. I don't mind answering. Oh, go on, Lynn. Go on. Our um, our constitution actually uh, specifies that uh, the committee has the option of um, removing uh, members if there is unacceptable behaviour. And it's uh, also our membership is at the discretion of the committee for actually accepting the membership um, at the beginning of the season. Thank you. And Garen, is that okay? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay. And then from, from Tony, um, in, a, in an unincorporated club, are the committee members implied trustees, for example, in signing a lease? I can feel that one. <laughs> The, the the trustees are if they are appointed as trustees as they'd have to be to sign a lease they are the trustees there is a certainly an argument that all of the committee members are in fact trustees even though they don't think they are because if there's a trust then they have to be trustees so if you haven't point, appointed them explicitly you may find that they exist now this has become important because of the registration requirement which is from hmrc I haven't been into that in detail, but uh, Nottingham know about it. Uh, I see that Ian Vincent's here, and uh, he has a man whose name I've forgotten, but I, rem I can't remember anybody's names these days, who is a solicitor who's looked into it. Uh, and I think Nottingham have completed the formalities. The, um, the problem is that it's quite difficult to know who the trustees are unless they're explicitly appointed. But if there's a lease, then they'll have to be because their names will be on the lease. And if there's um, any uh, gift given, they will receive it on behalf of the other people. But there are implied, uh, uh, trustees are implied as well as explicit. Okay, and then from Ross from Ramsgate, is anyone aware of any clubs incorporating as CICs, community interest companies? Yes, uh, Worthing Croquet Club is, although it's part of a larger organisation, a, a, a large body that does sports of all types for the uh, people of Worthing. Um, I haven't considered that because it's not one that would be uh, useful for most Kirky clubs, but it's larger organisations would do that. OK, thank you. Uh, that was all the chat questions. Um, now open to the floor, really. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, Roger from Crate Valley, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? Yeah, I did put one on the chat, uh, probably a little bit too late in the day for you ah, to see. Okay, go ahead. So I, I'll I'll just read it, and it says, "What would be the changes to personal liabilities of trustees, stroke committee members, stroke club members, in moving the club from a cask to a charity?" I can answer that one. In fact, it, it, the a cask and a, and a charity, that's a different sort of thing from the legal structure. If the legal structure is unincorporated, the members have a responsibility for the debts. If you're a cask, you can be a, uh, if, sorry, if you're an unincorporated association, you can be a cask, and therefore the liabilities are on all the members. The uh, position of a charity is the, is the same. You can be an unincorporated charity. But the point is that incorporation is what protects the members. Charity it actually imposes duties on the trustees, uh, but they will be the same people as presumably the same people. You, that depends on your constitution. You have to have a minimum number of trustees and so on. So the, there's a confusion there. The incorporation is that protects the members. The charitable status is what um, creates duties on trustees, but also, and of course, if you're a cask, you don't have to have trustees. The uh, the there, it's just the committee or the board of directors or whoever it may be 
uh, and that's why a cask was introduced so that you don't all have to be uh, operating in accordance with charity law you just have to operate in accordance with cask law there is actually one difference between which has been identified in a recent case a charity can claim the VAT back or can claim exemption from VAT on building work done on the premises, repairs to the pavilion or whatever. And CAS can't do that. It's a it's a, something that arose in a case, I think it was last year, but it was a bit alarming. It went to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal said, no, a CASC is not a charity, even though it's intended to be as near as anything to a charity. Thank you, John. Any other questions? I'm looking around the room. I, I did put an email on the chat. Um, uh, the, sorry, I put a chat on there about my email address. So if, if anyone wants the presentations or the CA uh, links, please, if they could email me. Um, and I'll, I'll read it out now if you want to. You could write it down if you wish. It's Paul W. Francis at icloud.com so what i will do is i'll arrange if you specifically want the presentations or you want the ca links because i know sometimes it's difficult to actually access i will do that for you um we did have scheduled tonight next generation as well but apology i put that back a month uh because i thought this was going to be quite a long evening on this topic and um so Hope Orton, who's here tonight, actually, will be talking about next generation developments next month alongside uh, handicapping when we've got Brian Fisk uh, coming along. But I will just briefly say about the next generation and just to be aware that we are about to launch a crowdfunding uh, project in the next week or so, uh, because this, this summer is our pilot year and we have got 15 pilot clubs and we have a need for quite a lot of kit you can imagine to get out to these clubs so actually we've now we've identified through mark Suter a very good croquet um, equipment supplier and the kit we're buying is quite robust and it will last for way beyond five years we hope and this will be lent out to the clubs now you can imagine it, this doesn't come cheap and we are estimating it's just going to come under about £1,000 per club for the kit. So we're looking for a, about a sum of £15,000 to fund our project this year. So that will be coming out through the e-newsletter and will be coming out to members in the next week or so. So please have a look at that. We've already got some quite exciting pledges. We have a lot of cream teas at clubs, especially in Yorkshire at the moment. Uh, we also have coaching sessions. Uh, I've got promise of books from Stephen Cussons Baker and Roger Mills alongside one-to-one um, -one coaching. Um, so that's building up very nicely. So please have a look in your e-newsletter e for the crowdfunding um, and also in our social media for the, on the Croquet Association website. Um, so I think, I think we're, we're almost there. I always try and end fairly promptly. Uh, many, many thanks again to our three presenters. I think it was very, very useful, especially if you're thinking of uh, the next steps. Uh, and I wish you well with whatever routes your club choose. So many, many thanks. Hope to see you again in March. Good night. Thank you and good night. Thanks a lot, Paul. Good night.